Not just for fifth grade field trips, learn about frontier living at Old World, Wisconsin. Farming, schooling, business, fun, and now brewing. Take a step back in time at this immersive museum. Old World Wisconsin is about an hour drive southwest of Milwaukee in Eagle, Wisconsin. Old World Wisconsin is a historic living museum with 60 unique structures on 600 acres. This museum opened in 1976. It features buildings built during the 1840s up to the early 20th century. The staff dresses in period clothing and is there to answer your questions or just have great interactions. You get to hear the immigrant stories and have some hands-on experiences. There are also excellent hiking trails, great landscapes, and active gardens. There are complimentary trams so you don't have to walk the entire grounds. Old World Wisconsin is laid out in three main sections, the Crossroads Village, Scandinavian Homestead, and Life on the Farms. The Crossroads Village is really cool. It's Old World Wisconsin's main street. Let's stop in to see the blacksmith at the anvil. Early days, they made everything out of metal that you can imagine. Every tool you needed, if you needed an axe or a screwdriver or a wrench, they could make one for you. If you needed a soup ladle, they could make that, a spatula. If you needed things to hold your pot over the fire, they can do that. Your farm machinery, they could fix. They were pretty much jacks of all trades and very essential. So the first thing you do is you take it down to a point and then put a little twist in it like that, or a curl, I should say. Not a twist. I'm gonna cool it down because I need the hammer on it in order to do the next part of my work here, which is to make the J. And I gotta heat the other end. This shop was in Ozaki County, north of Milwaukee, and uh, it dates to 1886. It was a second shop on the same foundation. The first one built in 1866 actually burned down. Unfortunately, when it burned down, it burned down the blacksmith's house, the hay barn went, the uh, local hotel went, and the tinsmith shop went as well. Well, the reason for that is there was no fire department in town. Which was typical of small 1880s towns in Wisconsin. Take it to a point, do it again. Do a little curl on this end, but in a different direction. So after everything was rebuilt, we decided that the town needed a good fire department. So he, uh, established the first fire department in town and built it right next to his blacksmith shop. <laughs> Very convenient. <laughs> he also became the fire, the fire chief for the next 25 years. Okay, to 
twist it, we use this little bent bar, kind of an S shape. S shape with really long arms. And that's all you do. It looks like it's the most difficult thing to do, but it's actually the easiest, obviously. Make sure everything's straight. Just to show you how hot this is, when it came out, it was about 2,500 degrees. It's still probably close to 1,900 here, because it's kind of a dull, you can't see it, but it's kind of a dull red. So it'll still start a fire. So the biggest hazard for a blacksmith is getting burned, obviously. The water does wonders, because it just dissipates the heat very, very quickly. You or your kids can buy some of the blacksmith's creations using tokens purchased at the entrance. Another token opportunity is at the local shoe shop where you can often see a cobbler in action. Yeah, so this is the Sissel shoe shop um, and this is where uh, Mr. Sissel, who was our shoemaker, uh, lived and worked. Uh, originally it was just this workshop and then the second room, which is the home. Um, and this is where he started his business. Uh, he was a shoemaker by trade, um, but as the years progressed and it got to be the 1880s and um, later, um, factories began to be really big in Wisconsin. Uh, specifically, leather and shoemaking factories were very big. Um, Milwaukee especially had the water from the lakes um, and as well as the access to the cattle skin that they needed uh, for the leather um, to make them one of the biggest leather districts in the world. Um, but yeah, so Mr. Sissel kind of was starting to face some competition. Um, and so rather than you know, keep just doing what he was doing, he added on the second room, which is uh, the showroom for factory shoes. And he sold factory shoes as well as you know, waterproofing, um, harness oil, he sold you know, laces, twine, all kinds of stuff um, to supplement his business of uh, shoe uh, making and repairing, as well as starting to repair harnesses and tack. Um, saddles, uh, you know, just anything that would go for horse, aprons, uh, belts, all kinds of stuff is something that he would take care of for the town he was in. Um, and that's one good thing that I have here. Anybody who's seen anything, have any questions? What can you get for the token? So the token, um, you can do a keychain. Hello, Hi. general store. Oh. Um, so for the uh, uh, tokens, we can do a keychain. So essentially, um, we would grab a piece of leather and go through the process of making a keychain. Um, it would end up looking a little bit like this, um, with a little Old World Wisconsin on there, so you remember where you got it. Um, and we'll hammer the back to be, you know, a rivet and everything. Um, and that is what I do with my tokens here, but there are plenty of other places to do tokens as well. We're going to stop at the brewery later, but now we will learn about the temperance movement at the inn. Here you can trade tokens for sodas. So this is the Four Mile House. It started off originally as a stagecoach inn, um, but later on when stagecoaches kind of became more obsolete and the railroads took over, it became more of um, a boarding house. So here we're in the temperance tap room right now. So the boarding house would not have sold any kind of alcohol. Um, instead we would have had soda water, which is the syrups that are on the counter mixed with um, sparkling water. And so that would have been uh, the big beverage of temperance. They also would have been selling, you know, things like coffee, tea, um, lemonade, water, things like that. Before you had Amazon, Walmart, and Sears, you had the general store. Many goods could only be found there. Here you can use your tokens to buy wooden whistles, lavender soap, cups, and candy. A pretty big staple, I would imagine, would be your dry goods like your flour and things. Of course, you could buy things in bulk, so then you could choose the amount that you wanted to buy. Another one would have been coffee, which is might look a little different. Does it look different to you? Yeah. yeah. It's unroasted coffee. So you would have to buy your coffee unroasted and then roast it in a pan like those on your stove. 
stays fresher longer this way than it does on roasted. Of course, not just your dry goods. Uh, by the 1880s, you could get all sorts of different manufactured products here, like our hardware section, which is great. But that nice gentleman across the road at the blacksmith shop, he doesn't like the general store because of that section. You can take a look inside St. Peter's Catholic Church. Originally in Milwaukee, this church was built in 1839. Another gathering place would have been the town hall. Public meetings and events would have been held there. Four score and seven years ago today. Got the Declaration of Independence on there, stand there. Read it. <laughs> I don't need to read it. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. The other place to use tokens is at the creamery to get ice cream. There are several flavors available. At the Crossroads Village, you can also visit homes of Irish and Yankee immigrants. Touring the Halford House, you can see the difficulties of household tasks. So what they do is they start by soaking the laundry overnight, either Saturday or Sunday, and then Monday was usually wash day. And they had this fancy lye soak, and just made with animal fat and wood ashes. And they would start by just putting it on the washboard. And then they'd take whatever they were washing and just start scrubbing it. And it's a long process. Normally it would take the entire day for her to do the laundry. And then after you were done scrubbing it, you would put it in the rinse bin. And then you'd use this tool. This is called an agitator, and what they would do is they would move it up and down and twist it. And this was usually done with like big batches of laundry in order to help rinse it, much like a washing machine would, just without the easiness of it. <laughs> yeah. And then when they were done with that, take it and they would wring it out and hang it on the clothesline. And then the next day would be reserved for ironing everything they had washed the previous day. So, three to four day process of doing laundry. Hard work. Yeah. And the woman who lived in this house was um, actually a washerwoman for work. So not only did she do all of her own laundry, but she did most of the towns as well. The Sanford House shows how someone more well-off would have lived. This Greek Revival style home was built in 1858. The prosperous Yankee home highlights items wealthy families enjoyed. The Life on the Farm section shows how old world practices evolved based on new challenges. It features homes of Pomeranian, Polish, and Hessian immigrants. The Schottler Farm has many interesting structures. This cedar log house is chinked with rye straw and clay. There's a bake house in this area where you can learn how to make bread. On the day we went, sauerkraut was being made. This is a very simple kraut, so we used our mandolin, which is uh, what we use to slice up very finely. If you look in here, you can see it's a very, very fine cut. And then once we cut it really fine, we add some of our salt onto there, and so we can add a little bit more. 
I've added so much of this, about two, one and a half of these in here. So but a lot of it goes a long way in breaking it down the sauerkraut, bringing out a lot of the water chemically. And so we can help form a brine. And then by using our tamp, we work it around physically break down the structure of the cabbage. And so this helps uh, further that chemical process as well. And so if you can see, um, the kraut uh, is starting to get a little bit more mushy, and then also a lot of that brine is starting to form. And so, um, now that we have it, it's pretty well mixed about, and we have a lot of brine now. And so, now, now that we, let's consider this done. And so we take out our tamp, and we're, what we're gonna do is put this in here. So this will fit exactly into there and we're gonna put that down there with a lot of uh, very well washed rocks and so that'll weigh it down that'll help form a layer of brine so that way it doesn't have any, don't have any solids at the surface where it can start rotting and that it wouldn't be good but now this will stay fresh and it will sit in there for about four to six weeks and that will turn it from cabbage to sauerkraut janine does love sauerkraut i do actually <laughs> a lot <laughs> yeah. The timber frame Schultz farm represents colonial Prussian dwellings. Here there is another impressive garden and large barns. This home has a large fireplace area called the Black Kitchen, often used to smoke meats. The Scandinavian homestead features homes of Finnish, Danish, and Norwegian immigrants. Here we learn how they lived and endured in a new land. One of our favorite parts of Old World Wisconsin is the Raspberry School. Be sure to listen to the teacher or you might end up in the corner wearing the Dunn's hat. Welcome to the Raspberry Schoolhouse. This building was originally built in 1896 and classes ran here from 1897 to 1914. The schoolhouse is originally from Bayfield County, so way up here at the very top of Wisconsin, about a two hour carriage ride away from the town of Bayfield. Um, so the reasoning for that short run period is, um, so there were five families that sent their children to school here. Uh, the original three. Uh, two of those families were Norwegian and one was Swedish, and so one of those Norwegian families uh, donated the land for the schoolhouse to be built. And then eight men from surrounding farms helped to build the building, even though many of them didn't have kids that would ever be able to go to school here. Uh, then later on there were two more families that decided to send their kids to school um, in this uh, building, and one of them was German and one was English. So all of the parents of these kids were immigrants, and all of their children were first generation Americans. Um, but they were all learning in English here in the schoolhouse, so they would have been speaking their parents' uh, native tongues at home, and then English here in the classroom. Um, in 1914, the last girl uh, graduated from 8th grade, which meant that there were no more kids to go to school here anymore, so she was the only one to go on to high school in Bayfield after graduating from 8th grade. And once she left, they pretty much just closed the doors to the school and didn't do anything else with the building. Um, those five families were the only families close enough to really do anything here. And um, because they had already used the building to its fullest capacity as a school, they just left it as was, which means that we ended up with a lot of original pieces in here. So the desks that you're sitting at are the original desks from the schoolhouse, um, as well as the bookcase over there, our blackboard, and the map case. And then the welcome sign above the door was also made by a raspberry school teacher. So kids would have been learning very similar things to what kids learn in school today. So they would have been doing reading, writing, arithmetic. Um, they would have been learning much more cursive than kids learn today. Um, but they also would have been doing things like history and geography. So I have a couple of history slash geography questions for all of you that are the same as things um, kids would have been learning back then. So the first one is, what are the five great lakes? Here. Here on? Yeah. Ontario. Ontario. Yeah. Michigan. Lake Michigan, perfect. Yeah. Erie. Erie, yep, and then one more. Superior. Superior, perfect. So this school was originally closest to Lake Superior because it's up here. Um, and the school was on Raspberry Bay, which is why it's called Raspberry Schoolhouse. 
Alright, so our next question is where was Wisconsin's first capital located? It's not Madison, I'm not sure. Yeah, I heard it in the back, Belmont. Yeah, perfect. So Belmont is down here. And the reason that that was our first capital is because there were big lead deposits down there. So um, all of those people moving to Wisconsin originally from both the East Coast and Europe were coming down into that area and they were, lying, they were mining for lead. Um, that's also how we got our name, the Badger State, because those miners would come in and instead of building their homes above ground, like we think that they would have, they actually dug into the ground and they were living um, in like offshoots of their mines underground, kind of like badgers. So, uh, you guys are welcome to go take a look around the rest of the schoolhouse, ask any questions you have, but class is dismissed. <laughs> Near the school is the Cavalli Farm. Anders Cavalli, a native of Norway, built this log home in 1848. The logs were hewn on all four faces and connected at the corners with dovetail notches. Here you can often learn about wool processing. So we're doing some of the very first steps of wool processing. When you shear a sheep, they only get their one haircut a year, so it's full of all the dirt and sweat that they rolled in and sweated since their last haircut. So before we even wash it, we want to pick it so that most of that dirt comes out and each hair is separated so that when we put it in the wash, it actually gets clean. And so to pick it, you hold kind of like a loose claw in one hand and then just pull little chunks of the wool out, kind of letting the dirt fall as you pull. And part of why this is important is because when you wash the wool, you can't stir it because wool is a natural fiber. Um, it'll start to felt if you stir it or agitate it at all when it's wet and hot. So we can't like stir the clumps to make sure they're all getting clean when we wash it. It needs to be already separated so that every hair actually comes into contact with soap and this greasy lanolin comes off so that it's white and clean and also less greasy and more pleasant on human skin when we turn it into yarn. This is like less than one sheep that I have in front of me, one sheep's pelt worth of wool. So the Cavalli family had over almost 30 sheep, just about 28 by the end of the 1860s. So this would have been a pretty constant process for them in the summertime. <laughs> um, they had a lot of kids, so it worked out well that they had a lot of hands, I'm sure, who could help pick the wool. But this alone takes a long time. And then even after you do this and you wash it, you've still got to cart it, which is another kind of time consuming process of brushing it out to fluff it up. And then it's ready to spin. And then it's ready to dye. So lots of steps between sheep and yarn. There are too many structures at Old World Wisconsin to cover them all. There are many barns throughout the site. Every animal that you come across during your visit is a heritage breed. You can find cows, horses, pigs, chicken, and more. The sheep are always fun. New this year is the brew house near the entrance. Beer making is a big part of Wisconsin's history. Brewers use local ingredients and historic recipes to teach the brewing process. You can sample the beer brewed here or get something more modern. We were able to speak to one of the brewers. Oh sure. Hi, I'm Rob. <laughs> I'm the coordinator of the Historic Brewing Project at Old World Wisconsin for the Wisconsin Historical Society. We built this building this year, well last year to open this year. So we started this program to show visitors how uh, beer would have been made between 1860 and 1900, uh, both on the farm and in production breweries. 
The production breweries were predominantly German lager breweries, and they populated the state a lot like craft breweries do today. There was one in almost every town, but they were brewing lagers, strictly German lagers, seasonal lagers, maybe one ale like a Hefeweizen. Uh, the farmers from Belgium and France and Norway and Sweden, uh, Denmark, they would have been brewing ales. So, and they would have been brewing in their summer kitchens or wherever they had space at home, maybe build a fire outside to brew. So they would have brewed in the spring and the, and the fall. They wouldn't have brewed in the summer, which is what we do here, we brew all summer. So we have some techniques that we're using uh, to try to get good fermentation in the hot weather. This building is not climate controlled, uh, so we don't have the advantage of air conditioning when we wanna get our fermentation temperatures. So everything starts with grain which we have some small samples of here. And it, it, it's barley for the most part for brewing. And when we grow it, looks like that. When it gets picked, this is just barley seed. This is an heirloom seed that we will plant next year. And what happens is the, the seeds go to a maltster. In the old days, they might have had a malt building on their farm. It gets malted. So they take the, the raw seed, they, they let it steep in some water and it germinates and it grows, just starts to grow the rootlet uh, about the length of the, the kernel itself and then they want to stop it. So what's happening is the plant is starting, the seed is starting to access the energy it needs to grow. We want to take that energy and turn it into sugar and make beer with it. So we stop the growth process of the, of the seed and it, then it gets roasted. And that roasting is the, the final part of, of malting. And what that does is it gives us both the enzymes that we need to break down the starch and it gives us the starch that we need to break down into sugar. If you don't malt, if you don't allow it to germinate, you never get those enzymes. So you have to brew with a malted grain, whether it's barley or wheat, that's usually one of the two predominant grains. But that's the malting process. Uh, so once it's malted, you're gonna have the opportunity to roast it to different uh, darknesses basically. So caramel malt has a little less sugar, a little more uh, caramel flavor. Uh, dark, dark malt, uh, chocolate malt will give you some bitter chocolate, bitter coffee. Black malt does sort of the same thing, adds a lot of color. So if you're brewing a stout, you're still using a lot of pale malt because you need the sugar, but you're using a lot of black malt too, not a lot, uh, a percentage, maybe 10% black malt to give it the, the color that it needs. Black malt doesn't really have any sugar left, it's all burned off. So that's the malt. Raw wheat gets used, or, or malted wheat. Corn is an interesting one. Uh, a lot of German immigrants, when they were brewing on their farms, they wanted a lighter ale. They couldn't brew lagers here because they didn't have lager yeast. They probably didn't have a cave on their farm to lager in. So they used ale yeast, but they lighten it up with some corn, and that just ferments very easily. You think about the American adjunct lagers today have a lot of corn in them. It's the same effect, but they were using it. So the cream ale was invented about 1850. We do brew that quite often. So when we, we get our grain bill together and we mill it, this is our mill, and all it does is crush it, uh, crush it, open it up, expose the starches, but also breaks up the husk so we can use that. That'll act as a filter. Uh, we take it, we take the whole bucket, it's usually about 15, 16 pounds, and we mash in. And this is our mash ton, and this is actually, t today's grain is in here. Um, so this is what it looks like when it's done with the process. And all we're doing is we're soaking it and we're, we're getting the sugars out of it. So if you taste that now, it's actually pretty, pretty dry. Oh, yeah, I was smelling that earlier. And yeah. It was a great smell. It's a great smell and we end up with the wort. This is actually just extra. We don't need that. Uh, the wort gets put in the boil kettle and I actually need to get this fire going again. You can you start to lose your roll on your boil and you just kind of give it some more fuel. And that'll kick back up. So the boil allows us to, uh, like we said before, get the hops in there, get the bitterness in there. Hop aroma comes later when we add more hops. Also sterilizes the beer and uh, stops the enzymatic process. Once we're done with that, we'll end up scooping it into our cool ship, which is this copper vessel. We just, we ladle it in through this filter here. This will sit on top. It's an antique German hop, they call it a hop jack. That'll catch all the hops, the whole cone hops that are in there. Keep them out of the wort. 
Uh, it'll sit in here for an hour to maybe two hours. If it's a nice cool day, it'll cool down to like maybe 80 degrees. A day like today, it'll probably still be around 90, 95, maybe even 100. Then we will empty it out into buckets and we'll put it in one of the vats. Let's say we're gonna use this one. Uh, so the fermentation vats, we'll just get the, we'll get the wort in there. We have copper vessels that we'll use. If we need to cool it down further, we'll fill those with ice and we'll kind of swirl that in there uh, just to cool it to the pitching temp. And then when we're ready, we'll pitch the yeast. And uh, depending on our yeast, it could be pitched at 65 degrees, 75 degrees. Some of these Saison and Norwegian Kvike yeasts will pitch at 80 degrees on some days, which is pretty high for, a, for an ale yeast. And we have, we actually took all the beer out of these. We packaged a lot today. Don't mind our modern, uh, we do sanitize uh, with modern sanitizer. Um, so this is the end of the process, but actually this is really good to see. This is, uh, this will get harvested. This is actually a pretty good fermentation in here. Um, this is the, the top, this is the croissant. It does look like there's a couple spots of bacteria, so maybe we won't uh, harvest this one. Um, but the yeast did its job. Normally that would be up on the top of the beer, kind of bubbling away. Sure smells like beer. Yeah, and then we use this kind of really fine cheese or butter cloth to keep out bugs, because as, as you know in the summer, there's a ton of bugs. Yep. And then this one is empty as well. He's, got, he's bottling this one right now. And that one also has a little, see this is a different yeast, so you're gonna get a slightly different, looks a little bit different, but uh, very fun to use all the different French and Belgian and uh, Scandinavian and German yeasts. We found that Hefeweizen yeast actually ferments really well in warm temperatures, but it goes really fast. So by like the third or fourth day, we have to package it and then we will bottle it or we'll keg it. We'll add a little bit of priming sugar to it or we'll add some wort that still has sugar, and that's where you get carbonation. Uh, the casks, however, once you tap them, uh, what, like today's, it probably already tastes flat, I'm not sure. When we tapped it, it actually had quite a bit of carbonation, but it's just, that's just gonna come out of the beer all day long in the, in the casks. So these will end up down in the cellar, and we will um, keep them down there for two-ish weeks, and then we'll bring them up and tap them and, and enjoy them. The Ramsey Barn is the museum store. Here you can find gifts, clothing, and handmade goods. There are also modern restrooms there. The restaurant near the entrance, the Clausing Barn Restaurant, is currently being renovated. Old World Wisconsin opens early May and runs through October. There are also special events throughout the season, including Legends and Lore, a Halloween themed event. Thank you for watching our moving pictures of Old World Wisconsin. Like and subscribe.